tangible and intangible. One, I do think that everyone should have a commitment to service, and I think the decision to serve in education, to serve children across a place like DC is always the right choice. Um, a second point is what we know to be true about having access to tutoring. I think in many spaces we talk about equity, and you know the word right behind equity is access. And what we know is that individuals who have access to resources, access to tutors, access to more, those children have different outcomes. And so we have made a historic investment in the district um, to the tune of $35 million to grow an ecosystem of high impact tutoring across the district and to target that investment in our media schools, serving our students who were most impacted by the pandemic with a long-term view of normalizing tutoring for all children and not making it be something that only certain children have or what we see in lots of underserved communities, something that is punitive or something that happens to a child. We want our children to learn and know how to say, I need help. We understand the value of a trusted adult in the life of a child, and that person does not always have to be a teacher. And there's a long-term through line to what happens when you can get young folks who are either in college or right out of college testing the waters of education. So many tutors step inside our schools, they meet our children, and they make a life decision to say, I don't just want to tutor, I want to teach, I want to stay in this fight. And so that's the multifaceted set of things that bring me to the space. And obviously, I've known Michael for a very long time. I've had tangible evidence of seeing the power of having high impact tutoring, having a tutor core, and what that does to a community. And just think it's critically important that these types of things get done with community and with partnership. And I'm just thrilled that you all are gonna grow and expand in Washington, D.C. Thank you. My name is Patricia, and I'm a senior at George Mason University studying sociology and Spanish, and I'm an incoming fellow. I'm Miss G, and I'm the fellow lead for the Wilmington campus right now. Um, I am planning on becoming a teacher, so I, guess I am. One of the people that is staying, right? So. And it's your second year. It is my second year. So you did a first year in New York previously. I don't know. <laughs> uh, my name is Darius Rose. I'm the director of recruitment for the Go Foundation. Uh, former teacher, taught fourth grade, and uh, really just passionate about um, finding these individuals to work in our schools um, and to serve our students, and also to you know find out more about themselves as well in the process. So, uh, really excited to be here. My name is Taylor Campers, and I currently serve at Grand Lexi Charter School um, as a fellow. Um, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Preston Whitaker. I'm a senior at Maryland, the College Park campus, and I'm going to be a um, uh, incoming fellow as well. And I'm uh, really excited about this program and the opportunity. So thank you. I'm Kat Peretti. I'm the executive director of City Tutor DC, which is an initiative to expand access to high impact tutoring, to bring providers like the Go Foundation to our fine city of Washington, DC to support our kids. Uh, and working across a bunch of different tutoring providers to uh, to accelerate students that were most impacted by the pandemic, working closely with Dr. Graham and her organization to do this. So thanks for having me. Thank you. Um, so my name is Alexa Squire. I'm the Chief Service Officer here in the District of Columbia um, and the Director of the Mayor's Office on Volunteerism and Partnerships, which is eventually known as CERN DC. Um, but beyond that, what brings me to this work is I'm a third generation Washingtonian. I'm the proud daughter of two retired DCPS teachers, um, educators, a, a strong line of educators, um, and someone who has really found a lot, a lot of value and purpose in being in service in our city. Um, I have the honor of, of, of 
producing and executing a really robust AmeriCorps program um, on behalf of Mayor Bowser um, and the residents and people like you. I think just looking at this group makes me feel so inspired. I think one of the dynamic things about DC is that how rich we are in culture. Um, and so what we bring, it's just a melting pot of really possibility and all of authenticity that we bring to our service. And so my goal and the goal of my team is to really work with you all and work with members and service ambassadors here in our city to make DC not just a place that you want to serve for one year or two years, but a place that you want to buy a home, want to you know start a budding career as, a, as an educator or as a civic uh, you know leader, and really again create the pathways and the, and the roads to make sure that you leave a footprint here that we're really proud of. Nice to meet you all. Thank you. <laughs> So I'm Michael Duffy, I'm the president of the Go Foundation. And I want to go back to something that uh, Christina said earlier, in talking about making tutoring available to all. So part of what animates the Go Foundation is we want to recruit people like Preston, people like Patricia to come in and serve in DC to help kids realize their full human potential. And so before you guys got here, we were talking about sort of working with kids, working with middle school kids, and how middle school could be a really tough time. And so I remember when I was in seventh grade, I fell behind in math. And my parents were able to get a math tutor to work with me in the summer in between seventh and eighth grade. And I went from the lowest math class to an algebra class. And that one intervention made all the difference in my life because that allowed me to take the classes I did in high school, get into a good college, go to graduate school. And so if we could do that, you know, and Ms. G, what you've done with your students to be able to kind of give them that little bit of help that they need that's particular to them that they might not get with a teacher. I think that's what we're all about. So one of the first questions I have, Darius, you're on the front lines. You're talking to people who are thinking about doing a year of service. When you meet people, when you're out on campuses, we were out this morning at the University of the District of Columbia, talking to students there. When you meet students um, across the country, what are they telling you and what are some of the considerations they have before they choose to do a year of service? Well, I would say that there is definitely a lot of interest um, in people wanting to do service work and wanting to help impact the lives of students. Um, I would say a lot of people, when they hear about AmeriCorps and they hear about our program and what we have to offer them, um, there are a lot of reservations around the living allowance. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, when they hear that, you know, housing is provided, utilities are covered, and some of the other benefits that are provided, such as like the Seagull Education Award, um, access to other state-provided benefits as well, um, that kind of lessens, I guess, the, the load of, you know, trying to figure out all right, what am I going to have to sacrifice in order to do a year of service through AmeriCorps, through the GO Fellowship? Um, so that's been like a lot of the conversations that I've been having to prospective fellows and prospective service members um, when talking about doing a year of service through AmeriCorps. It's that initial, you know, when they hear like the living allowance and like, ah, you know, I really want to do this work, but I don't know if I can make it work. Well, hey, well, listen, we actually do provide housing. We provide so many other resources um, to, to really kind of lighten the load and, and really help you do a year of service. And while doing the year of service, really focus on the actual work and the reason why you're interested and want to do this in the first place. So Taylor, do you remember, if you think back to when you first were making the decision to serve, do you remember the conversation with your parents about going and taking this choice as opposed to the some of the other things, what was that conversation like? I definitely do. I remember we were talking about different locations, it's like, well, New York versus New Newark. And I was like, I don't even know where Newark is. Like, what, Newark, New Jersey, what is that? Like, is it close to New York? <laughs> um, and my parents were a little awkward. Like, they have always pushed me to go. And I, they were never, like, afraid, really, for me. But there were some reservations. Uh, but with the fact that housing was provided, that really was a burden lifted up their shoulders, like, and worried for me because I just graduated college, I was trying to start a new job, and I'm moving across the country because I'm originally from Dallas, and I was going to school in Oklahoma, so that was a really far jump for me. And going there, just going to a new state without housing would have been a lot of extra added stress on top of all the new changes. 
but it was a great tour. I'm sure you kind of think about this a lot yeah. when you think about attracting people to DC given Absolutely. the high cost of living here. Yeah, so I, I, I go back to DC and not because it's home, but it's a dynamic place, right? And so with the challenge of, you know, it's a high cost of living uh, city, but there's a lot of resources here to be a resource rich uh, a city as well. And so I think I take, you know, the experience that you just shared and certainly your experience as a, cha a challenge and a charge for my team and I um, to really think about how can we be as innovative as possible? How can we be as collaborative as possible? How can we, you know, amplify organizations such as the Go Foundation um, that are, are getting it right and helping us to kind of cut down those barriers to really bring more solutions to the table? I think one of the other dynamic parts of our of our agency is that we get to really uh, have all of the multi-sector partners at the table. So the business community, the philanthropic community, nonprofits. So we hear experiences that are just like yours. We understand the barriers and we're able to work across sectors to find solutions. So I think, you know, we're, we're always thinking about that and really how we can work together to create that. So that's the sort of the service side of things. I've heard you talk, Christina, about the kids in this district uh, who need the support from tutors, um, particularly after the pandemic. What's the picture of what's happening in DC schools right now? And why is this important to you? I mean, one, so much to be proud of. And I am like palpably excited that you all are coming into the district and getting to meet and love on our kiddos. Um, I think on proof points of why we're proud, we have the highest enrollment in Washington, DC public education that we've had since we started counting children. And so what that tells us is after, you know, some really, really hard years, we opened our school doors and our families chose DCPS or they chose one of our public charter schools. And so that should tell you and others that you are entering a school system that cares deeply about our children. We are relentlessly focused on academic acceleration and our mayor and her exceptional leadership there is no barrier that we will not knock down in service of our children. And so that's what you are walking into. And I think Kat could, could be a testament to that. It's been a joy. I won't say all parts of COVID have been a joy, but it has been a joy aligning with all of our schools on every single challenge, particularly this high impact tutoring investment to have design sprints, figure out how to have scheduling, you will get a chance to go see students having access to tutoring in real time to see how quickly students have been like, nope, that's my tutor. Like, and there's a level of possessiveness mm -hmm. with children that are learning how to take pride in their learning, how to have relationships. It's helpful that you all are recent college graduates because in lots of ways they are like, wait, you went where? Like, I could go there too. Like you being from Dallas, the same way you're like, where is Newark? your students are going to be like, where is Dallas and how do I get there? Because we really love her. And those are the types of things we're seeing. I, you know, I think coming out of the pandemic, when the school doors first opened, parents were like, here, take them back. Because what we know now in ways that I don't think we appreciated before the pandemic is that it is more than just, school is more than just a place where we send our children during the day. It's a place where they're loved, they're educated, they're fed. Um, and parents can't replace that alone. And adding our tutors in, um, and this model of having it be school-based, community-based, partner-based, we are allowing our schools and our ecosystem to tell us how to meet this need. And you all are serving as like true integral parts of this solution. And even on data, I was with the chancellor this morning, we're already seeing dramatic gains in their Dibbles assessments and their math assessments. Like we are in our assessment season right now and it is exciting to see like data-driven hope as we come out of something that I hope we never experience again. And then just like my last point, we're all so committed to sustaining this investment and normalizing tutoring as an academic intervention. Um, and that's what you'll, you'll experience as you, as you come into our city. And Alexis and I work together a lot and I'm like, she gets to like, DC is great, it's a wonderful place to live. And I'm like, our school system is amazing. You're gonna love our children. Um, and I do think the through line for many of the tutors will be them deciding to become educators 
and join us. We have a long-term vision of creating a tutor, a, tu a teaching oasis. So how do we think about housing in this city? How do we think about celebrating the art of the teaching profession? Like how do we literally make this a place where you can teach, have the family, put your children in our home system and see the through line to become second generation Washingtonians. Third, like education is the pathway for that. And so we have a targeted focus on celebrating our educators and you all will be a part of that intentional design and celebrating. That's why this housing part is so compelling yes. for all of us because we're really starting to tackle the hard questions around what causes teachers to make different decisions, mm -hmm. what causes tutors to decide to become teachers. That's like this next wave of recovery is getting to systemic challenges to ensure that we have a strong teacher workforce to support a truly amazing school system. Kat, do you want to talk about the sort of the challenges that fellows who choose to serve in DC will face? No, I want to keep on the cheerleaders. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I think recruitment across the board for a year of service has been difficult uh, for a lot of the reasons that Darius already named. And I think that one of the things that excites me most about the foundation coming here, like look at this beautiful housing that you guys are going to provide. And I think there's two levels of, of equity here. You know, we talk a lot about, we don't just want um, kids with resources to get tutors. We want all of our kids to get tutors. And on a, another level, we want those tutors to be from a variety of backgrounds. We want our tutors to look like our students also. So we don't want our tutors only to be able to do a year of service if their parents can help them with the rent. So, Go Foundation is helping with the rent, right? And providing this gorgeous housing so that we can get a diverse set of tutors in front of our kids. Because we're seeing marks on assessments go up. We are also seeing markers on student well-being, which is at serious low points for our kiddos. They, everybody has been, all of us have been through a lot, but our kiddos especially have been through so much during the pandemic. We want them to have an adult that they trust. We want them to have an adult they can go to for help. And that might be you guys. And I'm so excited that you're here. It like makes me get emotional because we have more people that can connect on a very basic level with our kids. And we know that that will help them do better at school. So Ms. G, when you're thinking about your two years, you're in your second year, your first year, what difference did housing and the availability of housing as a part of your AmeriCorps year of service, what difference did it make to you in it? You know, we're live streaming and people may be watching this uh, beyond this room. What would you tell them in thinking about the difference that housing made to you as you made that decision? Um, so for my first year, housing was really the encompassing reason why um, I decided to pursue uh, education, but I also did want to uh, explore what teaching meant, you know, for me and what it looks like. Um, at least I know what it looks like now in charter school. Uh, teaching looks like in a different environment. Um, but I, my second year choice, uh, it allowed me to, because I moved from Newark to Wilmington. Um, I think if you have the, I guess, the, the nature of a wanderer or an explorer, um, it does give you that leeway. And I think the Go Foundation has found this great model of um, making having free housing and pursuing maybe, uh, whether intentionally or not, pursuing the idea of housing as a right as opposed to, you know, a privilege. So uh, I really like that that political side of it. And I, I think it's, housing is such a big part of livelihood and how you really kind of pursue life and how you live, so. What was the place like that you lived when you were in New York? Uh, New York. It felt very new, yeah. it felt very communal. Uh, it was so easy to get to know, um, like the male people, the, any staff, it's so easy to kind of create its own village in one year and that it feels like, how long have I lived here? Like maybe a year, but it, it felt longer just because of uh, the communal feel of it. So. so to Alexis's point, did it help you that you were a part of the community where you were serving, did that? Yes. Yeah. Help you with the service and the tutoring and mentoring of the kids that you're paired with. Yes, because I'm from Seattle, from the West Coast, and East Coast has a very specific culture of warmth, but also, uh, you know, we're kind of 
we freeze a lot in Seattle. Mm -hmm. in the time. So uh, I think it um, there's a lot of yeah culture, but also in terms of how we interact, the kind of language we use, and all these the kind of language y'all use. Yeah, kind of. In, in KCI, so we use. Uh, but the, I guess I'm part of it now. But uh, the East Coast, the culture, the uh, uh, in terms of I said the culture and what else am I thinking of? Um, the body language and the different slangs, everything. If I didn't live in the housing, I think I would have a really hard time connecting with the students and with the teachers and in general just uh, with the world or the environment and so on. How about how about for you, Patricia? How did it sort of affect your decision making as you were thinking about what you wanted to do after you leave college this year? I think that housing really made an impact in my decision because it would have been a huge barrier for me if I didn't have it. Um, when I was applying for the position, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do exactly, but I knew I wanted to serve during my gap year between you know, undergrad and possibly law school. So I wanted to do something that would really benefit me in that gap year and not take away from me. And if I had to worry about housing, I knew it would probably be a huge stressor during the gap year. So being able to rely on the foundation for that, as well as being able to do what I like to do, which is serve others, was a great combination in my, in, and it was a deciding factor in my decisions. Preston? Yeah, uh, for me, it was like an added bonus for me when I applied for the program. And also to like Washington DC is a really nice place to be. And it's uh there's so many places you can go and explore and all that. But yeah, it like uh added convenience for me and also keeps me in the area I enjoy being in this area. So. Well the other thing I was thinking about this, practically speaking, if you're gonna go into an apartment, you often need to get first months, last months, security, realtor speed. So <laughs> like $2,000 a month rent, that's like 8,000 bucks you need to work out. Yeah, it's a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Trust me, coming from somebody who is living in New York City and paying New York City rent, <laughs> it, it's, it's definitely a burden. And um, you know, I think one of the things that the Go Foundation does really well is, um, you know, we're radical, you know, I think that you know, we see that there is a need and that there is um, something that would make the, not only the recruitment, but the experience of our fellows a lot easier and providing the housing that we do really takes that off your plate. That is not something you ever have to worry about. And that allows you to do more with your time with the students. It allows you to do more time, um, you know, thinking about exploring your community. Um, and you can use that as, you know, a fully immersive experience so that way not only are you again working and serving but you're also living in that community which makes it a lot easier to relate to your students um, in the schools one of the other aspects of this is finding a sense of community so what has it been like in newark to kind of be with other people who are in the same situation how has that been a part of your experience it's been really great, honestly. I think moving to Newark as a person who's from the South, I did see a lot of people who looked like me. I really went to middle school, elementary, high school, where I went to school with a lot of white people, and I was usually one of two or a couple of three black people. And so moving to the Northeast, where nearly all my students were people of color, was really interesting and a culture shock, but in such a good way. And living with people who are from different parts of the United States was also really interesting. And I think that I've always had great roommates uh, both years that I've served here. And so when we bond together, and if you are so blessed to be living with someone who you work with at the same campus, you have a bond together, you bring that partnership to your campus. And not only are you making your home life strong, you're making your campus strong, you're making your campus strong within a fellowship, you're just really building to the community of what your campus is and it helps everyone along. So community is a really incredibly important aspect. And I also think it's a very seamless transition. Um, from college dorm life, you did live in dorm life um, when you were in college, moving into an apartment with other people, because that, I don't think we really talked about how jarring that transition can be going from like an adult who's graduated in their own right to an adult who works in the real world is working not a 9 to 5, but a lot of times it's 7.35, like it's very different. Mm -hmm.
And a lot of times when you're in college, you can find community by doing the same clubs or we have the same classes or, you know, we hang out in the same places after school. Well, when you're entering this new phase of adulthood, you don't have that all the time. So like having that built in community really helps with the transition from college to entering young adulthood. And it's very vital. Okay, I've heard you and Christina both use the word ecosystem of tutoring. And so when you think about the challenges of creating that ecosystem, and I know last year it was hard to recruit and find the tutors. Can you talk about some of the challenges that you've seen from schools and organizations that want to recruit people to serve as tutors and what they've encountered? Yep, absolutely. So I think even the most service-minded graduates coming out of school have to figure out, you know, how are they going to eat? Where are they going to lay their head? They're going to work out the math of, of their different opportunities. These are talented people. They've got options. So we're competing, right? Uh, the, the tutoring providers and and they're, they're competing uh, with a bunch of different other organizations that want to hire them in DC. And so um, I think we've seen that in sort of the AmeriCorps slots that have been filled. Um, and it varies a little bit by organization, but I think that the challenge has been there across the board with the vibrant hiring and um, the job market in Washington, D.C. So Would you, is it fair to say that there are tutoring positions last year that went unfilled because you just couldn't recruit the people to, to serve in them? Definitely. Some of our partners that, that typically hire um, service members have not been able to, to fill those spots. I think it's creeping back, but it's it's slower than everybody would like. and and. Um, I think the housing is going to go a long way, especially because you're so close to the schools you're going to serve here. Because again, when you're thinking about how am I going to make um, the living allowance work, you might find yourself an hour out. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that's going to be hard to be on time for school and do all those things. So I think, you know, um, prospective fellows are, are weighing all of those, those options and competing priorities. What do you see with other AmeriCorps programs and how they're thinking about this and meeting this challenge? Yeah, I think consistent to what you were sharing, um, across the board, there's been recruitment and retention um, uh, barriers uh, with a lot of our, our programs because of the pandemic, um, because of kind of those other dynamics of cost of living and, and this being such an incredible um, generation of, of, of young people with a lot of, of opportunities that are in front of them. Um, but I think that what you all are modeling at Go Foundation is we've got to be innovative, right? We've got to think about the barriers and then say, okay, how can we just like outside of the box? Um, I think that is really where we're going to find solutions and in the collaboration. I think, you know, again, I just think about how many, you know, different partners are here in DC. Um, we have everything that we need here. It's just a matter of us, again, aligning, understand the, understanding the scope and the issues, and then coming back um, to, to find How many solutions. AmeriCorps members do you think will be in DC overall next year? How many will be serving? Um, I think we will still have between four to 6,000. Wow. Yeah. So, I, you know, that number fluctuates between years, but I think um, between our programs and certainly our national directs, we will still have a strong core. Um, but it, again, it's making sure that each program is a great fit for them. Um, and I think that having housing and having some of those other, again, key components that really ensure that you have a strong service opportunity will, um, will be helpful. We just need a tiny bit of those 4,000. We only need 40. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. 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 We're, we're more than halfway there. There is. Wow. Four. Already? Congratulations. Um, yeah. Nice work. Nice work. Right. As of this morning, you said 24? I believe, yeah. I believe we're at 24, 25 out of the 40. Very nice work. Yeah, Very so, uh, that looks right. I mean, you all, I, I don't look too far from you. I'm blown away. <laughs> Did awesome. you see the pool? I know. I don't know. I'm on a tour. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. But I, I think, you know, I, I, joking aside, I, you know, this is my 20th year in education. When I became a teacher, I lived in the community that I taught in. It makes such a tangible difference um, when you show up on Monday morning and your kids are talking about the thing that occurred. You're like, oh, yeah, I saw that too. Um, or I was at Union Market, or I went to, you know, Rock Creek, or I was at the thing. And D.C. is so dynamic where every single weekend there is, 
huge cultural events occurring all across the district that your children will be a part of. And so, you know, when I was when I was your age, running into my students in Harlem, like at an event, you know, part of part of me was like, oh, those are my kids. But in their eyes, they're like, that's my teacher. Like she lives here. She she does her laundry. Like the kids are they're in awe. They're like. Why are you at the laundry? <laughs> because I have to wash clothes. Um, but they, they 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 see that there is very little space between who they are and the lives that they are living and who you are. And so it does mean so much that you live in community. Simple things like the metro. Like when your tutor when your two T is like I'm late, you're like me too, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, you understand those dynamics, and then you get to become a Washingtonian, which in this city means so much to the children that you will serve. And it's such a tremendous um, investment that you are living well in the city. And you know, Great Oaks has always been very intentional about not just providing housing, but providing high quality housing so that you all are not thinking about your housing, that every single day you're waking up ready to go be the best for, for our students. And I did not know that you were gonna be a teacher, but I'm like, you know, it plays itself out. And I just love your framing we don't talk enough about how we transition college students into the early stages of young adulthood. And this is such a safe way to let mm -hmm. individuals explore and make life, make very big life decisions with lots of things controlled for mm -hmm. in an environment of people who care about you as much as they care about the children you're serving. That's right, that's so important. Yeah. So when you came here, were you thinking that education was going to be a thing that you would do, or did that sort of happen along the way? Uh, well, when I was younger, I did really want to become a teacher, and then I was told, absolutely not. So uh, the, the pandemic, I think, unleashed a lot of courage. You know, um, amidst all the unknown, you kind of finally try to decide about what you want. So uh, I was like, I'm going to do this. So I. Uh, in some way, I'm honoring my younger version of myself. Mm -hmm. And I, it, if I could add, I think I, I too was a teacher. Um, earlier in my career, I taught at a charter school for about two or three years. Um, and I think, you know, from being an educator, you can be a school principal, right? Or you can be a leadership, or you can aspire to be like Dr. Grant here, but you can also be a head of a nonprofit, right? Or you could be the next chief service officer. I think so. I think the skills and the service that you all are really, uh, you know, just honing in on and really specializing, it can take you to so many different pathways. And so I think that is really the beauty of this experience is that, you know, we want you to be a part of, you're going to be a leader in some fabric, in some way um, within our city. So I think that is the great thing about it. And there are different paths too. Look, you I don't know if your dream of medical school is still <laughs> It's alive. still very much a dream. So I actually did not plan on doing the fellowship at all. I was definitely getting ready to take my MCAT, and then COVID happened, and I was like, um, is medical school even a thing anymore? Like, what, I don't know. Like, <laughs> what, is, what is life going to look like in the next year? I'm not sure. So I had to make a big decision. I was completely ready to go down that path. And I still am. I'm just taking a very unique route on the way there. Mm. But, but it will make you a better doctor. It definitely will. And that was definitely one of my reasons for wanting to do the fellowship. Um, I saw them like, I love working with kids. Like, my grandmother's a teacher. Like, I'm pretty sure I can, like, muster up something. Like, it can't be, <laughs> <laughs> like, it, it can't be that difficult. Uh, little did I know how nice. <laughs> um, but I definitely wanted to work with kids in a different aspect because I knew all the messing behind them and my minors in psychology and early childhood development. So like, I know children from a textbook, but I wanted to know them like working with them as people. Mm -hmm. And I think at the end of the day, that will make me a better pediatrician. And I've also seen how much, how many skills are transferable while you getting my degree mm -hmm. I'm currently in grad school uh, for public health. And I didn't realize it, but public health is around me every day. Every yeah. time I walk in that building, like it, this is public health, and I just love getting to see how my dreams are being fulfilled. But I'm getting to see so many different aspects from and perspectives from working with them. So it's really cool. Preston, how about you? Where are you headed? You know, sort of in the future, do you have an idea of the trajectory of your career? Um, I mean, uh, education for sure is in my career path. So this, I think, aligns very well with what I want to do in the future. 
but like um, everybody was mentioned and it's definitely like a career path that's like fulfilling one and that uh, you can grow in so uh, definitely uh, if it's something that I can definitely grow in it's something that I would consider for sure and Patricia you have a very different sort of course that you want to go yes. after you do your year of service yes Tell us um, about that. I'm actually very interested in immigration reform, so I, have, I hope to go to law school after my year of service. Um, and I have a few to picked out, but we'll see what the applications are looking like. Okay. But I, um, I'm really passionate about social justice and immigration reform and just being able to make sure that those policies are humane for anyone who wants to come here. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something I plan on doing in my career. And why not go directly to law school? I think we be here to do the AmeriCorps fellowship with the Go Foundation? Sure. Um, I would say that my undergrad experience was very jam-packed, very fast-paced, so I definitely wanted to take somewhat of a break between those two processes, but I feel like the um, the position that we're able to do with the foundation is rigorous enough, but also um, comforting enough to have a balance for that gap year so that I'm not like entirely stressed, but also not entirely relaxed. So I'm still giving back, but also um, you know, not stressed out completely the whole time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what's so dynamic about Washington, D.C., and I know you saw this as well, like because you will be serving in the nation's capital, that also is a city that should be a state. You will get it a lot. <laughs> um, I could look at each of you and think of like your next step. Mm -hmm. So like my former assistant super of health and wellness was a policy leader and she also was a practicing pediatrician mm -hmm. and that was by design. So like the entire pandemic, she would serve children and then come and write policy. And when I think about immigration reform, there is actually no better place to keep them to stay in DC, wrap yourself deeply in our work. Um, we in the administration take that work seriously. We put a lot on the line to protect the livelihood of everyone um, in this country that finds themselves here. And to both of you, one of, I was like looking at you and I was like, all right, well, do you want licensure support? Like, we can get you. We can get like, you. Do you want to come to yeah, like, do you want to come to <laughs> And it, that is, to Alexis's point, um, I have lived a lot of places. Um, but Washington, D.C. is so unique in that there is literally no path that you could say, I want to explore, and there isn't a clear road here, and a lot of support, right? Like there are scholarships to help you become educators, there are resources that would help you get into medical school. There's a whole ecosystem here of folks who care about immigration rights and do that work, and that's what's very unique about DC that you know rivals a lot of other places, and I think it's what brings, you know, it's why people want to go say they worked on the Hill for a year. What you're doing is way better. Um, <laughs> But a lot of people will make that one year sacrifice to get co deeply connected within Washington, D.C. because it serves them for the rest of their career. And I, I'd also share that while you all have this amazing opportunity to have housing in such a beautiful space, we also have a leader that understands the power of housing, right? And so the resources that we have that are available through the HPAC program that offers up to $200,000 now um, and down payment and closing assistance so that, you know, at some point when you finish your service and you're thinking how, you know, what, what is my next, you can also, you know, really have deep roots here and, and, and own a home. And so I think that kind of pathway between have, not having to worry about housing and then having those resources and investments that will help you to become a homeowner um, so that, again, you don't have to think about housing, but you can think about how you're going to change the world through immigration reform, um, it's just really just unprecedented. And so I think that is who we are here. I think she has a great vision of, of how we keep people just like you here in the city because we need you and we will need you. So Darius, when you think about the work that you're doing, getting up every day, why you do this, so you're a classroom teacher, you know, you're working in an administrative role, recruiting fellows to serve, why are you doing it? We'll get to other <laughs> uh, that's a great question and I think it's really just kind of in my nature you know I'm the oldest of four uh, so I've always kind of had that big brother mentality where I want to help people get to where they need to go and give them the resources and the support they need to get there um, but for me I think it kind of goes back to just you know my time as a teacher I also taught in Harlem 
Um, and just seeing like my kids' faces whenever they got something or whenever they, um, you know, saw that I was there for them. I, I remember I was like, I was eating dinner at Melba's and like one of my students came by. I was like, hey, Mr. Rose, like what's going on? I was like, yeah, man, you want some food? Like, so it's just like the, the look on their face, like when they see that they have somebody in their corner um, and supporting them um, is, is really, really great. It's really, really rewarding. There's really no other feeling like it, um, especially when you know all the hard work it took to get to that point, whether it be mix, whether it be through personal struggles, whether it be just like them just waking up and getting to school, you know, that could be an accomplishment in itself. Um, so I think for me, um, having had that experience, um, waking up every day to try to find and recruit and let as many people know about this opportunity as possible, um, it really is easy because of that experience and just knowing that there are students that need people in their corners. Um, there are students that are out there that just need somebody to make sure that, you know, they're okay and making sure that we have people in our schools to make our students feel seen and feel safe and feel heard um, is, is super, super important. Um, and, you know, that's kind of what kind of drives me through my day. And even when it's, you know, crazy and hectic because recruitment is a wild, wild roller coaster ride, <laughs> um, you know, just being grounded in that, um, you know, helps me kind of get through. So, Ms. G, when you're going through your day, are you sort of thinking about the experiences Darius is describing and filing those away for the day when you might be a teacher? Are you thinking, I'm going to use this experience? I, I got knocked down today, but I learned something, or I connected with this kid, and this really inspired me. How do you think about what you're doing now and how it might help you become a better teacher? It, it does feel as though I at least on our campus, they really consider us as kind of teach, teaching assistants as, or also um, sometimes just because my uh, my main teacher, she really, uh, she wants me to pursue the dream of teaching. So sometimes she does let me co-teach or, you know, allows me to prepare the lesson. So a lot of the lessons I'm learning as a teacher is not to take everything personally. Uh, so when the kids have really bad days it does really it does really affect me personally so i do i think i'm developing the skill of how to be communal with other teachers when i'm having those off days and sometimes it could be teaching can be very individualized especially when it's with a specific kid but i think uh right now i or i was the type of person that kind of if i had a really bad day i kind of internalized it as like a flaw um, so now it's kind of helping me externalize when I have really bad days and how to have uh, restorative conversations with students that's also helping me like outside of the school too. And conflict resolution is such a big, big skill that I did not, um, I didn't have and that now I have and how to have a, con a conflicting conversation with a kid, with a parent, with a teacher and all of those skills are coming to me through the eyes of the teacher but also seeing it. Um, as a fellow, it allows you to have like a safe, a safe distance to experience that, mm -hmm. but um, also allows you to immerse yourself enough to gain the lesson of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Taylor, how many students are you matched with right now? Oh wow! Um, just because of the needs of our campus, I'm currently working with three different grades. So let's see. About thirty-seven. Thirty-seven. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, it's a lot. It, and you're getting to know them. It's a lot. Yeah, I am definitely getting to know them. Um, I will have to say I'm a little impartial in fifth grade, just because a lot of them are on my dance team. So, <laughs> uh, oh, so, so in addition to tutoring, mentoring, you do an after school activity that you have to lead. Mm -hmm. So what's that? Tell us. Uh, that. It's called the LMS Dance Team, and we meet on Thursdays. We actually have performance on Thursday for a pep rally. So I'm entrusting it with the. Uh, safety of my co-fellows that help me so i know they're gonna be great they're practicing they text me after school and said oh my god these campers like we got that routine down we're so ready so i'm excited for them but yeah that's really fun i think having 37 students is a lot because the goal is definitely to be smaller dosage but because of the needs of the campus and also um just not having a lot of fellows 
can definitely be a challenge sometimes. But on the other hand, it's really great for community because you know such a large part mm -hmm. of the school. So and while it feels like you don't have those deep relationships, it just depends on the amount of work that you put in. Mm -hmm. Like you definitely can't. I, I'm with them for at least 52 minutes a day. And so you utilize that time how you see fit. Got it. Mm -hmm. and do you see yourself staying in touch with these kids even after your year and stuff? Definitely. I actually, my, I had eighth grade students last year and I only had eighth grade students. Um, and I've been to countless basketball games <laughs> and football games. Um, they're getting ready to have their prom, so I'm being prepared for that. And it's just like, oh, just like look at my babies, they're so grown <laughs> up. It's, just, it's, super, it's super interesting. Um, we definitely do keep in touch. They try to find me on social media, but I'm not really into that. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good call. Good call. Good Good private. Yeah, Good private. yeah that, that whole idea of keeping a distance between yes. you, it's like you're not their friend. You can be friendly, not friends. Friendly, but not friends. I like that. That's great. Can you think of a single sort of, if, let, let's talk about last year. When you think about the kids and your interactions with them, is there one sort of kid and moment that stands out in your mind as like significant to you that you'll never forget? I think it was my one of my eighth grade students. Um, she went with another fellow, and they just like they just didn't click well. Um, and then I had her. And we were really close throughout the whole year. She always said that, oh, this camper's like a big sister to me. And that was just really fun. And like, I could cry thinking about her. I still talk to her all the time. Mm -hmm. But she was really sweet in our relationship. While it, we were friendly and not friends, it was something that pierced me. Mm -hmm. Our time that we spent together and the conversation that we had, like, I didn't expect that coming from a 13 year old. Mm -hmm. And the problems that she had, that she's like, I can't tell my mom about this, I want to tell you. And like, you're really a safe space for them. And it was really sweet. And I, it's a lover, I went to her prom. Well, I'm going to her prom in a couple of weeks, so I'm excited for that. But I did not expect that at all. Um, she was class president, and so that was really fun. She mentioned me in her speech, and then I was just a mess. <laughs> I was like, you don't talk about me. I was like, you don't talk about me. You not talk about me. Yeah. But yeah, definitely, that was top 10, one of my favorite moments. It was not really one moment, it was just an accumulation of the year. And to know that I, our relationship impacted for that much meant a lot to me. I don't think I'm going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for letting us know. Of course. Yeah, it's very powerful. And, you know, I just think back to you know a lot of the conversations that I have with Perspective fellows, I know I interviewed you, and I think about you know, how I describe this experience to somebody who's never heard of it before. And I often go to that older brother, older sister, you know, with you in the school, making sure that you're, you know, doing the right things, coaching and guiding you, but also just sharing their experiences. Um, you know, that's typically how I like to describe it because you're going to have those experiences with students where, you know, you are going to be like that person that they go to when they can't go to anybody else. Um, so it can be a very powerful, you know, relationship. And this experience, um, you know, can put people in places where they can have a really huge impact. And it might not feel like it's a, a big impact in the moment, but just moments like this, you know, you can kind of look back and think like, wow, like that was really like a transformative experience and moment and relationship and bond that you built. Um, and there's there's plenty of fellow stories that, that have that experience um, and you know really this is what it's all about you know how can we bring people back into these communities to not only help these students but to really leave a mark and leave a positive impact um, it's something that we really need more of so Kathy and I have talked a lot about attendance and how we can sort of get kids to attend school more. And it seems to me, sort of the relationship that Tano described, like that's a kid who shows up at school because there's an adult who cares. I'm sure that that's a part of your passion about. 100%. And that's why I almost got emotional earlier when I was talking about that connection, right? Our kids are craving being seen, being 
belonging, having someone they can trust. And if that's you, you're so important. You're so important in that child's life, and it might make them want to go to school. And we've actually seen it in the initial data. Kids saying on their surveys, I think it's important to go to school every day. They're saying that more often if they're getting tutored than if they're not. So we're seeing some of these, you know, I don't know if we're going to close the achievement gap this year, but we're seeing really strong data points coming out of this high impact tutoring effort. And it's because of that human connection that's so hard to quantify, but is so crucially important. So that is what that Christina was talking about earlier that could get you excited. Yeah. Maybe we're actually starting to yes. see some positive signs. I mean, one of the best parts of our investment is it's partnering with the research institution. And so the Hamburg Institute is evaluating all of our efforts. And we will be excited to see concrete data that shows like students who attend who have access to tutors come to school more, or that trusting relationships with adults that are not just teachers of record are critically important. Like all of those metrics help solidify why we should normalize tutoring, you know, for children in ways that help them see themselves as learners, as dancers, you know. Um, and don't be shocked if you don't go to med school. I should break that to you. <laughs> I feel like someone should tell you that you may find yourself um, as a teacher uh, uh, sooner than you might think. But it's, it's those types of moments um, in a lot of ways, even if you lost contact with that student, this year has changed her life and it's changed your life and that's the we, we always think about like double generation effects and tutoring is one of those things where it's impacting the life of the child but it's also deeply impacting the life of the person serving and those children are going home to families as a different learner where they themselves are learning how to own their learning at a very young age which makes them have more agency in their own future outcomes. And I think the framing of your experience and like I know all of the things that you've accomplished and you to name like that tutoring experience as a pivotal moment, that moment has happened for the student that you have to serve. It happens to students that you're serving. And that's the domino effect that we want. We want more children to have those transformative moments where they see themselves going from a struggling math student to someone who is like AP algebra, let's go. And it occurs in these moments in ways that don't always happen when you are one student in a class of 37 with one teacher. Mm -hmm. That's what we're trying to control for here. And it, it is emotional and powerful when you see it play out in real time. Patty, I went to law school. I'm here to tell you that I'm to never like the joy of high fiving a fourth grader on the office, and they don't have those at law firms. <laughs> we'll bring you back into it. <laughs> so, Ms. G, when you were thinking about uh, choosing to do a year of service, there were other things that you could have done with your time once you graduated college. What would you say to somebody who might be watching this live stream about what caused you to choose it that they might take into account when they're making their own decision about what to do next year? So I was uh, I had I was in public health, so I do consider education to be one of the biggest concerns of health. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, so I have that reasoning from my parents, and for me, I think if you are kind of looking for your own sense of values and your own sense of self, you really do need to move and be in service work. Mm -hmm. So that was my reasoning is from, because I made a huge move from Seattle to um, Newark. So my, my own drive to find my own self outside of the expectations of uh, maybe college or even like the pressure of going to grad school and pursuing something very uh, permanent I think this was a gateway to, to exploring what type of worker are you? What kind of work environment do you, do you prefer? Mm -hmm. What kind of uh, uh, what kind of values do you want the organization you work for to have? Those all of these questions can be explored in a in a timely manner and in a very comfortable situation. I think that's not really possible in the real adult, real adult world. So that was my. It was a discovery of self as a worker and of course as a person. Who are you outside of these structures that were built? Like the educational system, the college, it's a, it's 
definitely a very structured system. So outside of that, who are you and how can you function in the world? And this is a very comfortable world. So that's great. That's great. Yeah. Preston, you have thought about what you hope to get from this um, from this year of service. Where where do you want to be on the other end? Yeah, so uh, with this, I definitely want to build on my skill sets of just working with people, especially with younger children. And what some people would say is like a difficult age range, I guess, depending on who you speak to. But um, it's always good to, you know, be able to uh, be able to handle all types of like age groups and also like different backgrounds and different places and things like that. So hopefully uh, after doing this uh, service, I can like pursue more into like the education realm and maybe get like, you know, the required like master's degrees and stuff. So it's always good. So Mr. Rose, I'll give you the, the last word. What What's uh, one thing you would want anybody who's watching this, who's considering Doing your service, what do you want to tell them? Oh man, it's a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. um, what I would say is, um, you really do find yourself when you, you know, give yourself up to, to service and especially service of others. Um, you know, thinking about all the interviews that I've done with fellows. You know, thinking about the times that I've gone to schools and visited fellows and seen them in action. Um, you know, seeing how they interact with students seeing how they interact with each other, you know, it really is a full-on, transformative, fully immersive experience. Um, I don't think you'll find anything else that can give you the experience of working uh, on the ground floor with students um, that will also help build up your skills, both soft and hard skills, and, you know, really help you find uh, your passion while also helping students find their own passion. Mm -hmm. um, this is a really great opportunity for people who um, aren't sure of what they want to do after college. Um, this is a really great opportunity for those who actually have some kind of pathway and want to build onto that before stepping into something full time. Mm -hmm. um, and this again, this is a great opportunity just to help people, just to help students, to help communities. Um, and to really give back. Um, so I would say if you are unsure, if you want to learn more, please go to our website, please reach out. Um, there are a lot of people that have um, a lot of resources and you know we really just want to put people in the right position to, to make an impact. That's great. That's great enough to end on. I want to thank everybody for their time and energy and coming here. You each contributed something really wonderful to, uh, to a pitch conversation. So thank you. Thank you.